The MPTF Media Center presents the international premiere podcast of Mystery Theater Audibles, Blackfire, a science fiction fantasy novel written and narrated by Anthony Lawrence, directed and produced by Madeline Smith-Lawrence, produced by Jennifer Clymer, sound engineered by Marcus Murrieta. The most beautiful thing we can experience is the mysterious Albert Einstein. Prologue, Virgin Valley, Nevada. I'm so fucked. I can be in a room full of people or on a crowded street in the middle of a city and still feel like I'm alone. But now, here, I feel the solitude like I've never felt it before. I can see the face of my watch, a tiny little second-hand arrow moving faster to mark the moments. And the feelings of fear and anxiety get stronger with each tick. A minute passes and I can see and feel the trembling beginning. as the tips of the fingers of my left hand. My breathing is getting more labored, just like when I was a kid. It's all coming back right here and now. When I was a kid, maybe it was okay considering the things that happened, but where I was. But now, I'm no kid anymore. I'm a man. I wouldn't admit this to anybody in the world, but but I'm here just by myself, so I can think about it without anybody else knowing. I'm so fucked. I've always been fucked, really damaged. But I just wouldn't let anybody know it, or even admit it to myself, but how could I? How could I not be fucked? Okay, don't go down that path. Sometimes denial is good. Sometimes it's the only way to keep going. All I have now are my thoughts and the will to survive. Shit, I've always had that. The will to survive. Something nobody can take away from. So I'll just stand here melting slowly like the <laughs> wicked witch of the West and think, think about it all. Remember it all. Don't let what I've been through destroy me. Just think. Remember. Remember everything. Even the smallest things. Especially the smallest things. Know what the word Nevada means? Snow-capped in Spanish. Well, maybe they, they get a light snowfall in winter. But heat is really what it's all about here most of the time fucking heat that boils your brain. Even in October, heat can take all the starch out of you. That's where I am right now. Somewhere north of Winnemucca in fucking Nevada. This time of morning, you can literally still see the heat out there. The rippling rainbow waves of it. Out there in front of me, hovering and trembling over the sagebrush that grows where nothing else can gray-green twigs and pale yellow flowers. Lots of old things have been found out there. The, the tule duck, the dinosaur fossils, the desert tortoise, bristlecone pine, the oldest living thing on fucking Earth. Okay, so maybe you don't care squat about twigs or fossils. Well, truth is, I, I don't give a rat's ass either right now. I'm in too much pain to care much about anything but surviving especially about what anybody else thinks. Maybe you don't really give a shit what I think either, but it doesn't matter because these are my thoughts, not yours. You're obviously paying attention to this shit, so blame yourself. But you know what? Trouble with people today, and, and especially so-called educated people like me, is that we're not really very smart. Okay, okay, maybe smart isn't the right word. Maybe it's that we're just not very perceptive. We just don't want to see things the way they really are. We get these notions and ideas educated into our heads, and all it really does is create these blinders so we can't really see or understand anything. Believe me, there are so many things we don't know. So how the fuck can you make a definitive conclusion that something does or doesn't exist based on what you know or think you know? Okay, so who am I? And what makes me so perceptive? Well, my name is Rafe Dillon. 
Rafe comes from Raphael, which I hated when I was a kid. I'm 28 years old. Knowing that or anything else about me makes you feel any better. Like I said, I don't fucking care. Yeah, yeah, I've got a, I've got a name and an age and a past to go along with it. But what does it all mean? What makes me so different from anybody else? Well, to begin with, I grew up in a few sewers. I spent most of my adult life working in the shadows. Now I'm standing here in the Virgin Valley where the sunlight and the truth hurt your eyes and tears at your heart. The sweat is running down my face and my head hurts and my stomach feels like somebody just punched me in the fucking gut. Okay, go ahead, ask the obvious. How the fuck do you end up standing out here in the middle of nowhere, rambling on, mind-fucking like some psycho nutcase? Well, if you want to know anything more about me, and even if you don't, we got to get the geography and the history right. Out there, over the Red Rock Mountains, north of the state capital, and 22 miles northeast of Lake Tahoe is the Neon Babylon, the city of Reno, the third largest city in the state. Reno is also sometimes called the biggest little city in the world, but it didn't take the world long to discover another Nevada hotspot right over in that direction, a dusty desert whistle-stop community known as Las Vegas. Today, the corporate hard asses have the same goal as the mobsters who preceded them, to make as much money as possible without regard to who gets destroyed in the process. Casino games are no welfare gift for mankind. They're carefully designed for no other purpose than to separate you from your cash. Yeah, I know all about it. Like I said, I, I worked in the shadows myself. Different shadows, maybe, but a fucking predator just the same. Okay, okay, I'll get to it. Just just give me a chance. I'm standing here drowning in my own piss and sweat. Maybe I should just forget about it all. Fall down on my knees, say a little prayer to God for getting me out of there and just die. But I can't do that yet. She might appear from the other side of that dune over there, like some shining Joan of Arc. She might come. She might have gotten out. But how could she? Just one of us making it out was a fucking miracle. I tried to help her, but I fucked up then and I, I couldn't save her. Maybe I should have just stayed there and died. I don't want to think about it, but I have to. Think about her, Jordan. Like the river, like the holy river, Jordan. A biblical name, place of prophets, miracles, and human faith. Where Jesus was baptized. God commanded righteousness and promised eternal love and peace. Where did it all go? Was it ever here in the first place? And will it ever be real for anybody? Jordan. Green eyes and long, silky hair. Beautiful, pale skin. I can see her. I can hear her voice. She's dead. She has to be dead. I can't think about that. I gotta keep thinking about other things or I'll crash and burn. Where the fuck was I? Oh yeah, yeah, I was thinking about Vegas. Well, during the 50s and 60s, Vegas kept growing with glittery casinos springing up on every corner. Downtown gave way to a new casino core, the never-ending incandescent strip with the famous resorts. Entertainers were brought in to add star power, excitement, and glamour. But underworld activities continued to cloud any truly legitimate, respectable reputation the city might have had at that time. Oh, you know all that, right? Well, you've been there. You lost your fucking shirt at the Mirage or at the poker and blackjack tables. Your wife ran out of cash playing the Wheel of Fortune slots and megabucks without ever seeing or hearing quarters and dollars belching out of the machines. But there are lots of things about gambling that maybe you don't know darker things that go back a long ways. Sure, the first European colonists had an affinity for games of chance. Horse racing, cockfighting, and lotteries fueled the appetite for betting and wagering. There were gambling houses and halls all over the place. Even George Washington and Ben Franklin got into the act, printing and selling playing cards. Near the start of the American Revolution, almost every fucking household in this new land had at least one deck of playing cards. We're not going back nearly far enough. Oh, 
not nearly far enough. Got to go all the way back. Some history buff who knew a lot about the history of gambling once said, they gambled in the Garden of Eden, and they will again if there's another one. <laughs> Maybe nobody really knows about that for sure, but there's plenty of evidence found in archaeological sites in Greece dating back to the 7th century BC that the Greeks used six-sided cubical dice called astragali for their games of chance. Architectural reliefs dating to 4th century BC portray Greek heroes Ajax and Achilles playing dice during the Trojan War. Yeah, the ancients credited gods and mythological heroes with the invention of gambling. Everybody from the Greeks to the Egyptians had some form of gambling. And everything from gladiator battles to horse races was bet on. But did you know that grunt Roman soldiers regularly played dice games during their campaigns and carried heavy and bulky gaming tables into the war theater along with their military equipment? The New Testament even tells us that Roman soldiers guarding Jesus' cross were tossing dice for his garments. So how do I know all this? Well, you wouldn't believe me if I told you. You wouldn't believe me if I told you I know every fucking thing there is to know about gambling and a hell of a lot more. You wouldn't believe me if I told you I worked in a casino night and day. Might have worked at this particular casino until the end of time if I hadn't broken out. And when I say the end of time, I'm not just talking about being stuck in some lousy job you can't get out of. I mean fucking until the end of time. Yeah, yeah, he's starting to lose it, right? He's starting to fucking come apart at the seams. But whether you believe me or not doesn't mean shit. The truth is all that matters, and I've got a hell of a lot of truth to unload before I sit down to the desert floor and fucking die. Okay, what is it about the seductive powers of gambling that is so inextricably tied in with human history and behavior? Is it just simple greed? Denying the imbalance of chance? Sticking your fucking tongue out at fate? Or something even more fundamentally a part of our nature? What the hell is it in us that include both of conviction that the unusual must happen and a refusal to believe in it when it does? Pagan rituals had a purpose of foretelling the future and explaining what was beyond comprehension. Now they used pebbles, nuts, sticks, and arrows. And sometimes, in the evolution of these rituals, they included sacrifices from the participants to encourage fate or the gods to deliver positive signs and help. Maybe that's how it all started in the first place. <laughs> oh no, correction, not maybe but for a fact, right up there with God and Satan gambling on the fate of humankind, wagering the good of Job against humankind's natural evil in the very first fucking game of all. Okay, okay, stay with me now. Maybe this stuff is all way over your head, just like it was mine until that day when I found myself locked inside a world I couldn't even begin to understand. But I'm part of this legend now. <laughs> I wish I weren't, but I am. And whether I'm going to live through the experience is still an open question. I'm going to try because of her. Because of Jordan. Because I still somehow feel she just might fool me and appear out of the rippling heat, out of the sand and rice grass. But I think I, I, think I am beginning to lose it. I know I'm just rambling on, but I can't help it. It's the reason for everything that's happened to me. My thoughts are all running together like the tributaries of some mental rivers that flow into the deepest part of my mind and, and end up in the same place. It's as though something is forcing me to recall everything, like something is searching for some missing pieces inside my head. It just all seems so crazy when my logical mind gets back into control. Even now, after all I've been through, how can you possibly believe what I've seen and done? It's the stuff of classic horror fiction fantasy time. But it's what happened, and I lived through the result. Lived? No. No, I survived. Somehow. 
and I'm still surviving it. Maybe not for long, but I'm still here, rotting in the sun maybe, but still hanging on, hanging on just long enough to remember it all like some kind of pathetic nightmare that you know wasn't real. Only my nightmare was real, and is still real, and I can't fucking wake up. Chapter One Tommy Hammer Rohash was high, but this was due to something else in his system other than excitement, as Ben Latimer raised under the gun with King Nine and Jerry Halt call in the early middle position with Ace Two of Clubs. Even pretty wasted, Tommy read the situation perfectly and figuring both players had weak hands, elected to make a giant re-raise with a trash holding of 6-2. Tommy won a nice pot for his squeeze play efforts, but it took its toll on him. It was at the final table of the 2004 World Series of Poker at the Red Horse Indian Casino just outside of Sausalito, California. Jordan Carroll knew Tommy was under the influence. The usual cool and sexual arrogance was diffused by a louder voice, and he was too antsy and loose with his chips. His breathing was getting more labor. He was beginning to sweat, and there was a glazed and dangerous look in his eyes that was the sign of a gathering internal storm. Jordan knew that she needed to get him out of the tournament because he was going to crash, and soon. She had liked Tommy more than she would be willing to admit, and she respected his skills, but she was furious, disgusted, and as the tournament director, it was her responsibility to keep things running smoothly and to avoid any conflicts or calamities. She knew his temperament all too well and suspected he wouldn't go quietly into that good night, especially when he appeared to be on a winning streak. But her job was on the line, and she had to act quickly and quietly. Often when she was dealing at the club, she had to get rid of drunks and unruly customers. She could call the floor manager or security to back her up and take on anybody who didn't like her call. She could still yell for security now if she needed to, but it was Tommy. And while she felt sick and betrayed by him, she wanted to do it with as little commotion as possible. Jordan breathed a sigh of relief when she called him away from the table and he put up very little objection. He appeared to already be aware that he was at the breaking point and almost relieved that she was giving him an out. She helped support him and moved him surreptitiously through the crowds to the restroom where he seemed to be heading without her direction. She could see that he was ready to heave, and that he couldn't get there fast enough. He barreled through the door and she waited just outside, unable to avoid hearing that dreadful retching sound. Then the rush of vomit, as he was obviously huddled over one of the toilets. She leaned heavily against the door, tears welling up in her eyes, her dismay and outrage rising. He had promised her never again. Still in her twenties, Jordan Carroll had a worldly weariness, a streetwise, sometimes coarse toughness that she wore like a suit of armor quite beautiful, with piercing green eyes, pale skin, and long marble-streaked hair. There was a deep core of pain and brooding bitterness that she tried to hide. She grew up in a small northwestern suburb. Her father was alcoholic, a tough, hard-edged man who worked with his hands and his back when he worked. Her mother died not long after Jordan was born. She became something of a slave for her father to work and beat into submission. But Jordan was a born survivor grew strong and taught herself everything she knew, including poker, a game that was one of her only retreats from her abusive father. She grew to love the two Ps, poker and poetry. It illustrated the dual nature of her personality. She found something very personal in the symmetries of poetry and poker. Something seemed to define her in Texas Hold'em and Emily Dickinson. She found solace in both. Jordan loved books. She had a computer, but she would never dream of owning a Kindle or an iPad. She felt technology was slowly robbing people of great sensory pleasure. She liked the feel of real playing cards in her hands, not online poker sites, of real books, the actual turning of pages, the owning of books on shelves, the look of jackets and print. She was bright and she was determined. Jordan managed to get to school and stay there even after her father died of acute alcoholism, then fought against the state's efforts to make her a ward of the county. Later, after managing to graduate from high school, Jordan made her way toward a new life on the West Coast, riding her red and white Harley-Davidson Sportster motorcycle. 
but she stopped in Las Vegas where she learned more about poker than what she knew when she was younger. Staying there for a time, she played more poker, moving up slowly in limits and becoming a regular at the local casinos. She worked as a prop player for a while, studied books about poker, and eventually played tournaments. But when she grew tired of the drunks, the furious pace, and bright lights of the strip, she rode her sportster on to try her hand at the many Indian casinos near San Francisco, California. Jordan had begun realizing that she really wanted to learn how to be a dealer more than a player. She liked money, but she didn't like losing. And there was something about the control and power of dealing that seemed to appeal to her nature since she had been so denied these feelings while growing up. She moved to Sausalito, just across the Golden Gate Bridge from San Francisco, attracted to the artistic enclave, a picturesque residential community where she worked her way up in the nearby Red Horse Scotts Valley Band of Pomo Indian Casino from a chip runner to a dealer in almost two years. Jordan became a very good dealer, had quickly learned her craft and the difference between being good to the customers and taking a lot of shit. Jordan knew the Indian houses made concerted efforts to boost their odds of winning. She didn't like it, but she lived so close to her work and enjoyed having an easy bike commute and access to Baker Beach just across the Golden Gate only a few miles away from where she lived, so she stayed at the Red Horse for that and other reasons. One of the other reasons was meeting Tommy Rohash, that good-looking and cocky young tournament player who continued to cause her such heartache. It was during Tommy's college years that he began doing really well playing online poker, so well, in fact, that he dropped out of college before he got his degree, and his decision to play poker on a full-time basis before finishing his schooling did not sit well with his family at the time. But it wasn't long before Tommy became a 24-year-old poker pro, winning six major tournaments, including the prestigious Legends of Poker. By the time he and Jordan met, Tommy was easily the most accomplished poker player in the final nine of the WSOP 2003 main event. His opponents considered him fierce, cool, and his stare was enough to intimidate the most skilled player. But he had his own hidden vulnerabilities that he covered up with a bad habit. Jordan had left him puking in the men's room because she had a job to do. She had gone back to the tournament and finished out the night. Tommy never came back to the table, and she knew he had gone home to sleep it off. It was a long tournament, the post-drinking and game analysis eating up the night. By the time she got back to the little apartment they shared in Sausalito, dawn was breaking, sunlight beginning to warm the little artist's community. She was packing her bags as Tommy began to stir struggling to awake from his sprawled out position on the bed. He was still in his clothes, managed to sit up on the side of the bed, his face chagrined as he watched her for a moment. What the fuck are you doing, he asked with only the slightest contrition in his voice. Jordan continued to pack her anger building. What does it look like? Okay, I fucked up, I just couldn't cut it. Neither can I, not anymore. Tommy rubbed his face with both hands, trying to forced the blurriness from his mind and eyes. Okay, come on, baby, he whined. It was the pressure, all right. It won't happen again. I won't be here to find out, she snapped bitterly. He climbed to his feet, tried to wrap his arms around her like he'd always done before, but she wrenched violently away from him, her face blazing with fury. Get the fuck away from me. I've had it with you, Tommy. I'm out of here. Don't you get it? Tommy softened slightly and implored. Give me another chance, all right? I'll, I'll go back into rehab. She couldn't hold it in any longer. She screamed at him. Rehab doesn't mean shit to you. You had somebody who loved you, but that didn't work. You have a gift out there on the tables, but that didn't work. Nothing works with you. Go live in that fucking crack house. I'm not going to stay here with you and be your caregiver. God only knows what you've already done to my baby. It's over, you hear me? It's fucking over. Sobbing, she dragged her bags out the door, slamming it in his face behind her. Chapter 2 The next few months alone were difficult, but Jordan toughed it out just like she had always done. She grew bigger until her belly almost touched the tables as she dealt cards in the casino. She got morning sickness and nausea, and even riding her beloved Harley became more difficult. Just getting on and off became a chore. But the people at the club were all good to her. Buddy Carp, the floor manager, liked her. He's a good friend and helped her find another place to live. Then as time got close, they gave her weeks off to have Cody and to bond with the little guy who now gave her incredible joy. 
Oh, he was a beautiful child with silky blonde hair, green eyes like his mother's, and only the slightest resemblance to his father. The pediatrician had assured her there was also no sign of any damage from Tommy's addiction to crack. Cody just seemed like any normal, adorable baby boy. And Jordan loved him and spoiled the hell out of him like any normal single mother. Cody swiftly grew from an infant into a toddler who seemed to enjoy his new life immensely. Jordan grew crazier about him with each passing day and saw to his every need. When he couldn't sleep or cried, she crooned to him and recited from her vast repertoire of Emily Dickinson. But it always calmed him down. Cody wasn't old enough yet to quite understand what she was saying, but he loved every word and giggled as she acted out the verses for him. She tucked him into the special child seat she'd installed on her Harley and took him with her every minute she had away from work. She even brought him to the club now and then to enjoy how everybody was getting to know and love him too. He seemed to get a big kick out of sitting and watching the slots whirling lights and looking around at all the people, his big grin revealing how much he liked the attention that he was getting. He wasn't even supposed to be allowed into the casino, but this was Cody, Jordan's kid and they bent the rules for them both. Jordan took the boy everywhere she went in Sausalito and across the bridge to the main city of San Francisco. He loved the zoo and the aquarium, Chinatown, and the view from the top of Coit Tower. But one of his favorite haunts was Fisherman's Wharf. Cody loved the fresh ocean breezes while watching local fishing boats offload their morning catches. He enjoyed the fast food spots on the wharf, and delighted in the many shops, but best of all was the Sunset Wharf Walk, when it was quiet, and sometimes it was just the two of them watching the fog roll into the evening beach and covering the sun's deepening hues. As time went on, Jordan added to Cody's learning by teaching him everything she knew. They spent many hours at the beach, and she taught him to swim about the same time that he was beginning to walk. He took to the water with exceptional natural ability, and it wasn't long before he was boogie boarding the smaller waves with growing skill. Jordan heard through the poker grapevine that Tommy had shown up at casinos in Vegas and Atlantic City, but she had little interest in following his exploits. Any love she had felt for him had blown away on the crack smoke. What love she had left after that experience, she showered on Cody, and she saved every dime she earned so that she could put him in the best schools. She knew well about the Odyssey School in San Mateo. Odyssey was an educational environment for gifted and talented students. It was a school she knew could take her growing boy and make a fully dimensional and worthwhile young man out of him. It was Jordan's day off, and she had brought Cody to Baker Beach for a picnic and swimming, as she had done so many times before. This time of the week and day, there were few people, and they could enjoy a little solitude with the sun and surf. Jordan placed their beach chairs, towel and bags, down on the soft white sand, carving out a sizable area for their comfort. Cody pulled some flippers and a mask from his bag and then revealed a deck of playing cards. He shuffled it a quick few times, then fanned out the cards in front of Jordan. She quickly picked one and placed it face down in Cody's right hand. Guess, Mom? Ace of spades. Cody peeked at the card in his palm. It was a three of clubs. He smiled broadly. Nope. Finally, he was going to outsmart his mother in their daily sleight-of-hand card game something they had been doing together since Cody was a toddler. Check again, said Jordan. You're forgetting legerdemain. Huh? It means to manipulate secretly. Cody checked the card again, and it was the ace of spades. He was stunned. How did you do that? I'll teach you when you get a little older. Cody shook his head in disbelief, trying to understand how his mother could have switched the cards without ever touching them. Speaking of getting older, Ninth birthday's coming up. Can you wait? Cody suddenly looked a little distant. I'm always waiting. I wait and wait, and I think he's going to show up. Jordan instantly knew who Cody was talking about. She had spent most of the last nine years trying to forget all that Cody's long-gone, drug-addict father Tommy had done to them. So the last thing in the world she wanted to do was discuss something agonizing that had been sealed and locked away tight in her mind and heart a long time ago. I know it's been tough, Cody, never knowing your dad, but I knew him. Think about now, baby. That's what's important. Cody considered the weight of his mother's words. 
I just really hate him. The sun was bright on Cody's handsome features, and whether Jordan liked it or not, with each passing year, she could see more and more of Tommy in his looks. But that's where the similarities ended. In what seemed like days, her newborn had grown into a sensitive, kind, and intelligent young boy standing before her, and Jordan suddenly felt he deserved to know everything. Listen, Cody, I know we've never really talked about this. It's okay, Mom. I know why you left him. You do? You wouldn't let him legitimate you. Cody's simple explanation moved Jordan to tears. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. Come here. Cody moved to Jordan and hugged her tightly. She held him with the kind of joyfulness that only a parent really knows. I love you so much, kiddo. I love you too, Mom. He held her even tighter. And then Cody took off toward the ocean as the surf crashed against the sand. Cody dug into the sand with his hands, searching for seashells or anything a beachgoer might have left behind. Cody had been collecting things like Hot Wheels, coins, and old decks of cards since he was five years old, maybe in order to create his own identity in the absence of his father. He suddenly looked up and pointed to the outer Richmond neighborhood to the south. Mom, can we get a banana split later? Jordan nodded as Cody looked her way, meeting her eyes for a quick but satisfying moment. And then the moment was over. Cody quickly located a small seashell in the wet sand, slipped it into his bathing suit pocket, and then jumped into the foamy ocean water. The early morning fog had cleared away and the sun made the beach and the water warm and comfortable. She glanced out at Cody and watched him for a moment as he caught the gentle waves slipping him back toward the sand. Not more than five minutes later, she seemed to hear his screaming, first with her unconscious mind, like a shard of glass that cuts through flesh but doesn't cause immediate pain. Something sends you a danger signal, and adrenaline begins to light up your brain. Jordan was on her feet in seconds and sprinting toward the sound of the screams. Very few conscious thoughts passing through her mind, only the panic that sears through a mother's entire system when she knows that her child is in great danger. Her feet pounded through the sand and she propelled her body toward the water, the panic rising each instant. She could not even imagine what was happening, but she knew it was something awful. She had never heard Cody sound like that, the screams broken only by a kind of muffled bubbling, as if he were struggling in the water. God was her only thought, why wasn't I watching him? The churning of white water foam was only a few yards offshore, but Jordan knew that Cody was at the center of it. She could see his head and arms struggling and squirming as he tried to scream and to stay on the surface. She knew he was a very capable swimmer and that something was happening that was not the result of a simple drowning. But whatever it was, she had to get him and fast. Jordan plunged into the waves head first, then wildly cleaved through the water in her effort to get to her son. She could hear him choking and sputtering, screaming as if in severe pain. But in her brief moments of glancing forward in the progress toward him, she saw no sign of what she had feared most. There was no indication of some huge predator shark beneath the water, with its savage jaws clamped on some part of Cody's body. Jordan knew intuitively that it wasn't anything like a shark, but whatever it was, it was causing him great pain and distress. Oh God, why wasn't I watching him? Closing swiftly in on Cody and whatever it was that was threatening him, Jordan began to make out something beneath the surface and all around her son. It appeared to have multiple coloring and a kind of shapeless mass although something in its form reminded her of a large open umbrella. As she reached out toward Cody to somehow extricate him from the creature, Jordan felt sudden sharp pains like electric shocks in her hands and arms as she came in contact with it. But she fought off the pain and grasped at Cody beneath the surface, trying to gain some purchase on his body. She was horrified as she made out the quivering thing under the water that was attacking her son. She knew instantly what it was as she stared through the water at this mass that so perfectly represented both beauty and beast. The colors of the soft-bodied entity in the water column ranged from reddish brown to yellow and purple, blue and pink, a rainbow of toxic stolons, strands of tissue and gelatinous material that floated and undulated in the swirling water. Cody had been enveloped by a bloom or swarm of Chrysora colorata, a purple-striped jellyfish, sometimes called a smack, which infests the waters off the coasts of California. He was covered with a very high density of tentacles containing nematocysts that were delivering excruciating pain from their stinging orifices. Cody was already suffering from nausea, vomiting, and cramps, as well as the pain and 
slow suffocation from being drawn underwater in the vortices. Jordan was also being entangled in the vial's fringe-like protrusions and mucous membranes, her body twisting from the pain and toxicity. But she fought valiantly to free her son, to disengage him from the swirling green bioluminescence and the nematocyst lances that continued to pierce their skin. Jordan felt like she was dying, shock already beginning to numb her senses. She clawed at the mass of transparent tissues that floated around her in nightmarish clusters, clinging voraciously to her arms and hands, face and body as she fought to save Cody. But her body was already lapsing into anaphylaxis, stiffening, growing rigid. Only the cries of Cody made their way into her mind. It seemed she felt a human touch and heard voices shouting, but it must have been part of the dream that consumed her. Horror had mercifully been replaced by a kind of fugue and near-silent grace. She didn't know they were rescuers, who were already wearing barrier clothing, pantyhose, and full-body sting-proof suits. She didn't know they had already rescued someone else in the vicinity and responded when they heard her screams. The voices and hands were grasping at her body and mind, but she could not quite make them out. That's when Jordan slowly slipped from consciousness. 